I'm a feminist, but... Hello, Brisbane! I am a feminist, but... If I had to have one celebrity threesome... If I had to... And my choices were either celebrity threesome with Virginia Woolf and her lover, Vita Sackville-West, or keep it local, Brisbane, Brisbane Gold Coast threesome of me, Jacob Elordi, and, and Margot Robbie, then I would certainly do a tribute to Virginia Woolf by making sure that Jacob and Margot and I got a room of our own. I'm a feminist, but when I tried on my stage clothes for the first time since six months and realised that none of my pants fit, I decided that instead of buying new pants, I was going to wear no pants. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... Last night in the hotel room, uh, I was uh, going to watch um, a feminist documentary about the um, peace camp of the 1980s, and instead I watched three hours of Married at First Sight Australia. <laughs> and, and really victim-blamed some of the women on there as well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Just for staying with the worst guys you've ever seen in your fucking life. I've not finished, so no spoilers, but uh, where I'm at is just like justice for Lucinda, guys. Come on. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... I'm a feminist, but it depends on the restaurant and how expensive it is, because times are tough. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but tonight a wonderful local Brisbane makeup artist came and gave me smoky eyes and completely fake eyelashes. And I looked into the mirror and I just thought, I can fight the patriarchy so much harder with this because it's like attitude on my face. It's like you can draw attitude on your face. And honestly, most of the time, I'm just really amazed that the patriarchy let us have makeup because it normally steals all of the good stuff. And they do not realize you can reveal, you can conceal, you can play, you can give yourself war paint. All I'm saying is, Makeup makes me a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> I am a feminist, but when breastfeeding my children, I like to balance between reading romance novels and reading Jack Reacher books so they get the right gender balance in the milk. <laughs> <laughs> How have you come to the conclusion that romance novels and Jack Reacher is a non-binary combination. <laughs> Feels like a pro-binary. I feel like my milk is more masculine when I'm reading Jack Reacher. <laughs> and my milk is more feminine when I'm reading Bridgerton. And I gotta, I gotta get the right balance. You gotta titrate your levels. I see, I see, yeah, no, I get it, I get it. It's a good theory. Uh, I'm a feminist, but it makes me uncontrollably enraged when um, period products are called things like, hey girl, and goddess, and diva, because I just think it would be more realistic if they were called things like, fuck off, <laughs> and bloated and crying. And no, just no. Just no. Just no, no girl. It's when you see tampon commercials and they're all like playing volleyball on the beach in white shorts, and I'm like, when the fuck has anybody ever got up on their period and thought, anyone for volleyball? Like, anyone for white shorted volleyball? Please fuck off. Of all of the things that are in my way between me and playing volleyball, period is like the last in a very long <laughs> list. Me too. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when I was younger, I dated this guy who said that if we have children, he gets to name every single one of them, and I don't get a say. And he broke up with me. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to start the show? Then welcome, welcome, welcome to the Guilty Feminist Brisbane on the Australian Live Tour. Please give it up for Alice Fraser, Grace Petrie, Anissa Nandaula. Some incredible women you'll be seeing a lot more of this evening. Along with another very special guest. Hello, Brisbane. We're back. We're back 
in you. It's so exciting. Thank you so much for coming. Just give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. <laughs> give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. <laughs> okay. There's a, I, I, don't wish, I just do not wish to impose gender on you, but are you, are you a man? Yeah, you because it because it, it's felt like a uh, I, again I don't want to impose this upon you, but what I'm reading here is a white straight cis man going with a beer going yeah I don't know what I'm at, <laughs> which given how outnumbered you are, sir, is quite brave. <laughs> it's quite brave. Uh, did you come with someone who brought you? Yes, who who brought you? Your wife and her friend <laughs> said you need to come to this. <laughs> what was that? To be supportive, yeah. It's not to be supportive, sir. They want to teach you something. <laughs> they have no interest in being supported at a feminist room. They have all the support they need here. They're looking for you to change and learn. That's what they're looking for you to do. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, what's your name, sir? Rich. And I don't want to call you Rich's wife because this is a feminist show. Uh, but what's your name? So she can answer her own name, Rich. This is why she's brought you, Rich. This is why she's brought you. What's your name? Amy. Amy, am I correct? I am correct. Thank you very much. I could tell. But I love your confidence, sir. I love your confidence of drawing attention to yourself so early in the game. I feel if I was at a men's rights activist experience... And I was called upon to say, you know, I, I would stay very low key, very low key. But interest, I find it interesting. There's always men in the front row. They're always very, very confident, very, very confident. I admire the braveness. Um, again, I do not wish to gender you, but are you in fact a man? Yes. Okay. Two, two men. Yes. Excellent. What made you want to sit in the front row? You what? You bought the tickets. Are you on a date? Long-time girlfriend. You bought the tickets for your girlfriend. Yeah. I find there's a lot of men who buy the tickets on the third date. And I think what they're saying is, look how safe I am. Allow me to entertain you with feminism. Uh, but I'm delightful that you bought the tickets. Do you listen to the show? You do listen to the show. Okay. Uh, what do you enjoy about it? It's quite funny. Excellent. Thank you. That sounds like medium funny, sir. No, you're, you're lovely. Thank you so much for coming. What's your name? Matt. Thank you so much for coming, Matt. Um, just give us a cheer if you think you do a feminist job. Just give us a cheer if you think you do the most feminist job in the room. Yes? Okay, what's your job? I'm a period pain educator. So a, a period pain educator. Excellent. Educators about period pain. What's your name? Kate. Kate. Kate, do you want to come up the front so we can get you a mic? <laughs> Educate us about period pain. What do we need to know? Oh my gosh. I could I run workshops with children all around Australia, okay, mainly Queensland. We educate people assigned female and assigned male at birth. We educate everybody. So I can educate you for sure. But that would take probably like at least an hour. Okay. Okay. We don't have time for that. <laughs> can I have the microphone back? <laughs> very, very, very quickly. Okay. A, your pain is real. Okay. Do not believe if someone dismisses your pain. If you feel it, it is real. Do something about it. Get it addressed. I believe in you. Okay. There are very few, like, many, many things, naprogesic, consent, taking care of your whole health, your whole well-being, being heard, being believed. Heat packs, TENS machines, suppositories, just, oh my gosh, so many things. Talking about it, feeling heard, feeling listened. I could go on forever. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Kate. Um, Kate, what do you need from this audience? Do you need them to come to you? Do you need money? Do you need support? Do you need them to share stuff? Do you need them to tell people? Do you need schools that will let you go in? I what is it that you need? would absolutely love if you could go to pelvicpain.org.au and book in a pep talk. Okay, you can book it for your sporting group, your community group, your school. Go for it. If you don't have anyone who you're connected to in that way, write to your MP because our funding runs up at the end of June next year. So end of June next year, no more funding for pep talks about period so pain. So who, who could give you that money? The government have to. Yeah, federal health. Federal health. So yes. is anyone in this room connected in a way that that yes, yes, what's your what's your what's your role? 
senior director of the federal government. Okay. Excellent. So can you hook up Kate to try and get her, her funding again? Oh, her brother works for the Department of Federal Health. This can be fixed in half an hour. This can be fixed in half an hour, unlike period pain. Is quicker to fix the funding than the period pain itself. Kate, that's fantastic. Did you give the mic back? Yeah, excellent. Other, I mean, I would be happy for you just to sit, you know, with a friend like the hecklers from the Muppets throughout the show, to be honest. Um, that's great, Kate. So, now, listen, you've got to meet, what's your name? Alicia. Alicia in the interval. So, see the bar up the back on the right-hand side? Can you just see there, that near those doors? You're going to meet Alicia in the interval, and you're going to change numbers, okay? Now, and you're also going to meet Alicia's... Best Alicia's best friend. Three... Three, this is my rule, three is a coven. Okay? Two is a meeting, three is a coven. So you're going to have the period pain coven up the back of the right-hand side of the bar as we're looking at it, okay? Excellent. Well done, Kate, thank you. Can anyone here, has anyone here got an organisation that they could book in a pep talk for? Just give us a cheer. Excellent. Just remind us of the URL or where do they go, Kate? publicpain.org okay what pain pelvic pain not public pain not public pain listen your listen the pain may well be public but that's irrelevant to this url the key thing is that it's pelvic other sorts of pain have other urls this is specific to a pelvic pain so if you can book a pep talk, the other great thing about lots of you here tonight booking pep talks is that it shows that there's a demand that will help when we go for the funding in the coven up the back. So if you'd like to be involved in that coven because you think, oh, I've got something that could be helpful or I've got an organisation and we've got six branches or whatever, go up to the coven and say how you can be helpful. Um, do we have anyone else who needs help here, Brisbane? Anyone else who needs help, needs a coven? You're doing something in Brisbane? Nobody else is doing anything. Only pelvic. Yes? What's yours? Uh, the podcast called Your Ex-Boyfriend's Past. And we're looking for people with big date stories. Okay. You, are, you have a podcast called Ghosts of Boyfriend's Past. And you are looking for shit date stories. Is that right? So bad boyfriends from the past. Bad exes, bad boyfriends, bad first dates. Okay, so anytime love has kicked your ass, um, what's your name? Uh, Liz. Liz. Liz, have I done your podcast? You I feel I have done your podcast. <laughs> so, Liz, how do people contact you to tell the stories? Ghosts of boyfriends past at gmail.com. Ghosts of boyfriends past at gmail.com. Are ghosts of girlfriends welcome or no? Ghosts of anyone. Basically, we had the name before we had the podcast, so it's non gendered, non binary, any exes, we've been there, we've come to Okay. <laughs> So, just for the people listening at home, any ex who's a dickhead, it is non-gender specific, but they got the URL too quickly. I feel like the same thing's going to happen with pelvic pain. They're going to start saying, well, there's other sorts of pain that might be period-related, we'll have to take it out of the pelvis area, but they'll be stuck with the URL. That's just what happens in life. That's just the story of feminism. We've all got stuck with URLs. Do you know the number of people have said to me, why are you guilty as a feminist? You shouldn't be guilty as a feminist because it's the name of the show um, and here we are now we this is our 401st episode we did our 400th episode the night before last in Melbourne or was it last night I think it was last night in Melbourne was it last night Kylie no we don't know um, uh, and here we are in Brisbane 401 nearly 200 million downloads um, and I'm loving Brisbane, the Fortitude Valley Music Hall. Isn't this amazing? Look at this. This is a sort of board made of all these little lights. It's, and this has got a, if you're listening at home, it's got a side of me. And I'm a feminist, but when I came in here and saw this, do you know what I said? Oh my God, this makes me feel so petite. <laughs> look how little I look in comparison to the King Kong version of myself. Um, all right, who does something unfeminist? Who thinks they've got an unfeminist job? Give us a cheer. Oh, you sound sad. 
Who thinks they've got the least feminist job in the room? Yes, who is that? What's your least feminist job? A software engineer for a duvet company. <laughs> Doesn't sound that unfeminist. We all need duvets. Feminism need to, feminists need to get to sleep at night. We need self-care. A fumigation company. Well, it depends. Of what company? Computer games company. Okay. So, well, okay. Software engineer at a computer games company. And I can see a lot of computer games might be at times, a little bit problematic. <laughs> nay, misogynistic. Nay, homicidal. <laughs> However, do you do any Trojan horse feminism at that software company? I put clothes on holograms. You put clothes on holograms? Yes! So, do sometimes do you put on more clothes if you think that the female characters are being exploited? Yes! yes! <laughs> this is what I've discovered, Brisbane. This is what I've discovered. Every feminist who says she's got a, 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 a she or they have got a, or he, have got a, a, an unfeminist job, secretly is Trojan horsing feminism in. I had a woman go, yeah, I've got a terribly unfeminist job. I just help rich men get richer by telling them what to invest in. And I said, do you do any Trojan horse feminism? And she went, oh yeah, all the time. I tell them to invest in things that will not make money, but I think are feminist. And I said, isn't that illegal? She said, I don't care. I don't really want the job anymore. Now that's feminism, when you're prepared to do six months in a minimum security prison for feminism. That's feminism. Oh yeah, you might have a job in literacy, but are you going to go to jail for it? No, everyone will celebrate you and say, what an amazing person you are. Now when you are working in computer game software development and you are secretly taking clothes off male characters and putting them on female characters, I assume that's how it works, you've got to get them from somewhere. You're, 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 doing, you're, you're, you're doing something there. Not to say that women can't wear what they want. I'm not slut shaming the computer game characters. Don't worry, don't write in, don't write in. I understand women can expose what they want. They can reveal, they can conceal. That is totally up to them. But I don't feel that the, the avatars that we have a choice of always represent what we would most like to conceal and reveal. And sometimes, let's be honest, they are male gazing it upright nice. And so I love what you're doing. What, are there any computer games you work on you can tell us about? Or will you get fired whenever they hear this? Which they will. <laughs> you can't say. But if, but if we go and we think, oh, they've got more clothes on than normal, we know it was you. <laughs> I would ask what your name is, but I don't want you to say it. Because currently you're undercover. You're basically like a spy working in gaming. And that's, we need more of that. Um, Listen, Brisbane, you've done very well. Uh, is there anyone else that has anything to declare before we move on? Yes? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You need a mic for this because I feel this is going to be poignant and interesting. Not that yours wasn't interesting. Just... <laughs> but this feels bigger. It feels bigger. Can people hear me? Uh, but, yeah, but no one at home can hear you because it's a podcast. So a podcast... <laughs> It's radio that nobody stops you making. So tonight, if you do a laugh, you'll be able to hear it when you listen at home, which you will listen at home, because you'll be like, I want to see what they cut out. And let's be honest, a lot. Um, we're probably going to slag someone off and then cut it out. Um, so could you please come down? Thank you very much. What's your name? It's me again, Felicia. Oh, Felicia. Excellent. So Felicia, public health Felicia. Okay, great. Felicia? Um, I just want to share with everyone that I'm going through my seventh round of IVF and I am paying the absolutely eye-watering sum of $17,000 for one round of IVF and that in Australia that's normal and that women needing to sap their superannuation accounts to pay for assisted fertility because I'm a child of the 90s, I didn't get the memo that if you didn't get pregnant before the age of 28 you're probably not going to get pregnant but in Australia, IVF, completely unregulated industry, um, I have now sapped upwards of $70,000 uh, from my superannuation account um, for assisted fertility, and uh, that's not okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Felicia, be before you go, you work for public health. Sorry, I should have said before you go, before you went, really, shouldn't I? Um, that was remiss. You said... Uh, you, you, you work for public health. You work for the federal government. 
And so internally, could you have a word? <laughs> I've had words with uh, many uh, stale, pale, male senior <laughs> leaders in federal government. And uh, you might be surprised that but actually when I got an audience when, what, with one of the senior people in the tax office about this whole superannuation debacle, that they said the fertility industry provides us with feedback all the time about how great it is that we allow women to access their superannuation, to pay $17,000 per cycle for IVF. Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? I bet they do, because um, they want the money. In London, you can, the council will pay for IVF up to a certain age. I think not over 40 or something like that. Maybe it's 35, I don't know. But they, they will pay, the, depending on your council, every local council will pay a different thing. But definitely you can have some IVF on the council. It's just, okay, so it's completely profit-making. I did think when you, I heard you say IVF, and the reason I wanted you to take the mic is I thought, is she going to, I just want to check in, is she going to ask if anyone's got an egg? And... <laughs> But if anyone does have an egg, I don't know. Are you using your own eggs or? Okay, you'll be for the coven. Are you? Do you need eggs? Probably. What was that? Does anyone have an egg they're not using that they would be open to using? Yes, you've got an egg. Twenty-one and healthy. Okay. Um, if you, if you're, I mean, listen. Don't make this decision now here, because I think we can all be swept away with the emotional rally-like feel of a feminist crowd. Um, don't actually extract an egg in the interval. You need to ask your doctor, think about it, talk about it. But if you would like to join the coven to the right-hand side of the back bar, Felicia will be there anyway. So, um, you know, it might be useful if you are serious about an egg. It really does help. Um, I know I've been through IVF myself and I didn't have a baby, but that's all right, don't feel bad. If I sometimes if I say that, people go, oh, it's all right, look, I, I'm, I, it's fine. I ended up having a lot of brunches instead and it's... <laughs> In retrospect, I think I got the good end of the stick. Look, look, I have a, I have a, a screen. Of, I wouldn't have this if I had a baby. That's, that's what I'm saying. Um, I'm sure if I had a baby, I'd be thrilled to have a baby. There's a baby backstage, actually. We love babies. I'm not a monster. Um, but, you know, if you can't have one, you might as well crack on with what you can have and enjoy that. That's what I'm saying. Felicia, I wish you well with extracting an egg from a 21-year-old feminist. And also, with you know, write to your MP and say we would like some fertility on the government. It's pretty normal in other countries. It's certainly normal in my country. And <laughs> my God, if you can get it through the Conservative government, <laughs> the most brutal, the most, the most unfeeling Conservative government we've ever had, which is saying a lot, then Queensland really should pull its socks up, because honestly, normally you're ahead of no, normally you're ahead of you're ahead of us in everything. Queensland. No, no, I know. I was born here. I remember him. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Queensland, Queensland used to be 20 years behind everyone else, but not now, I wouldn't say. Oh, oh okay. Political debate. Who thinks Queensland is worse than other places? Okay, who thinks Queensland is doing okay and, you know, let's not, let's not give it the old... Excellent. All right, so we've had a referendum... And we've discovered that Queensland's okay. It's, o it's okay. It can all do, every state could do better. But the other day we were talking to a sex worker in Sydney on our show, and she said Queensland is one of the first to decriminalise, which really helps sex workers, because otherwise sex workers get pushed underground, they get in horrible situations with men controlling them. Sex work is going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. So empower women for whom that is their role. And uh, that's what sex workers say they want. So we've got to listen to that. And I was really shocked that, like, they were saying, oh, yeah, Queensland's ahead. There's only, like, four places. It's sort of like New Zealand and then four states of Australia. And they said nowhere else in the world is as ahead with sex work as these four states. So I, and I said on the sofa, oh, my God, I'm so thrilled Queensland is, is leading the way in, in human rights. Thrilled? I was a bit shocked, but I didn't want to say that here because I want them to like me, Felicia. I want them to like me. And I think, listen, listen, I think Brisbane's an amazing city. And every time I come here, it's more amazing. Um, it was, it's much better than when I was born here. I don't know if I've improved it. I don't think so. I left quite young. Um, anyway, the point of the matter is we've got to get on with the show. Bye, Felicia. Thank you. Um, well, that was an exciting moment, wasn't it?
we got funding for pelvicpain.org and an egg for IVF. Now, I think what that demonstrates is Felicia offered the funding to public, not public, to pelvicpain.org, and then something came right back to her in the form of a free baby. So, listen, sometimes you think, I make all these sacrifices for feminism, but no, uh, it won't be free. She's still got to pay to have it in a little... It'll st- she's still going to pay a lot. We'll do a whip round. Felicia, if you're going to sort out pelvicpain.org, in the interval, go up to the coven. We'll have a little basket up the back. If you want to pop something in for the IVF, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. Did you click in a way of like, yes, you'd put something in? Or was you just were you just clicking for... You were clicking for yes. Yeah, okay. So if anyone wants to pop something in the tin there, you can either say it's for pelvic pain... <laughs> Or it's for having a baby, which is also pelvic pain. Um, Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. I had the most amazing time in Australia and New Zealand, Aotearoa, touring all your wonderful cities. Thank you to everyone who came out and supported the show. It meant the world and the shows were so wonderful, buzzing and successful. I appreciate you all so much. Audience, guests, poets, singers, everybody. Uh, Now, we have some more live shows coming up in the UK. Our second ever Waterstones Book Club event is on Wednesday, the 3rd of July with author Laura Elkin. Jess Foster Q and I will be talking about Laura's book Scaffolding with her. It's a feminist book about ghosts, homes, and the cycle of history. Now, we are contrasting each and every one of these with a feminist classic because we want to be reading the books we should have read and finding a fun and interesting way to do that. So we'll be contrasting Lauren's book with feminist classic Inseparables by Simone de Beauvoir. If you're going to read the Simone de Beauvoir, get the translation that Lauren Elkin herself did. And she obviously knows that book inside out, having translated it and done a preface for it. Uh, So hopefully you'll be able to read both of those books before you come, but it doesn't matter if you haven't read them. We'll do it in a way that we'll deep dive, but it won't matter about spoilers. Come, 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 but get your tickets now because the last one sold out well before doors opened. Our show at King's Place is on Monday the 15th of July and it features previews of some of our favourite comedians before they head off to the Edinburgh Fringe. Join us to hear exclusive sets from Jessica Regan, Alison Spittle, Kate Checker, Zoe Brownstone and Sarah Barron. If you are going to the Edinburgh Fringe, what a great place to see some tasters, to see some shows that you might like. If you're not going, this is your chance to see the Edinburgh Fringe in one night. We will also be at the Edinburgh Fringe from the 12th to the 14th of August at the Gilded Balloon with an amazing array of co-hosts, guests and music. For more information and to book for any of these shows, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on Live Shows. Also, please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. Give us five stars and you could review any episode or any live show. Uh, Join Patreon, tell a friend with your face, uh, anyone you think might like the show. And now back to the podcast. All right, are we ready to start the nuts and bolts of the show? Then please welcome back to the stage my co-host for this evening, it's the Korean incredible Alice Fraser. Hi. Alice. Hello. Come take a seat. I shall. Thank you so much for coming. It's, it's an absolute delight. This is the first time I've been on stage in six months and I am thrilled and also doing a little bit of wee. Uh, listen, I'm so delighted to have you. And uh, we met your baby backstage. Yes. Um, who was in a, he was lovely, absolutely lovely. You see, Thank you've you. Been, he's a very you, polite baby at three and a half months old. He's really polite. He's really, really charming. Like, every time... Like, sometimes uh, Alice had him in a little tent. So he was on her, but then he was, like, he was splunking. Um, he was down there. I don't know what he was doing. But every now and again, she'd just lift the tent. So, you know, and he'd be always going... Like, looking out. He seems very happy to the baby. He's very charming. This is the thing about babies. They're quite charming because uh, if they're not charming, you want to put them in the bin. <laughs> it's their only survival mechanism, really, is being so be charming. Well, I don't, don't think all babies are charming, though. I think, famously, some babies are very, very difficult. They, they walk a fine line. <laughs> they do. I think they, go, they, they oscillate between being absolutely terribly hard work 
And sometimes like, oh my God, how will I continue? And then they suddenly turn on the charm when they think, oh, I might've pushed it too far. <laughs> and then they go, look at my big eyes. I'm so beautiful. I need you so much. I love you. And then you keep the baby. Yeah, I, I'm very grateful to have had babies in the modern age when you have multivitamins. In the medieval times, they used to say you'd lose a tooth for every child. Wow. And uh, you lose a tooth for every child. Yeah, because they just that. suck it out of your bones. Ooh. If you're, if, you're, if you're breastfeeding. Oh, did you know if you're breastfeeding and you haven't had enough to, enough to drink, you can feel your mouth going dry? Ooh. <laughs> I find the whole... Listen, babies are great, <laughs> but I find the whole having one, pushing it out, and then the way it's sort of there's a cord between it and you that you have to cut, and then that it wants to feed off you like a parasite. Extremely sci-fi. <laughs> It is extraordinarily so sci-fi. sci-fi, and I am a feminist, but yes. the last five minutes of a completely unmedicated birth, when I was in the push phase, pushing a baby out of my vagina, is the only time in my adult life that I've ever felt entitled to scream as loudly as I could. Mm, interesting. So and I genuinely had that moment when I was screaming of going, no one can stop me. <laughs> It's true. It would be, at that point, really tactless to say, could you keep it down? (laughs) Who would dare? Um, Like they have said to me when the first time I had a Brazilian wax. They actually said, there are people next door and you're scaring them. I was like, well, then you should make it less painful. Um, And once, this is true, once I went for a Brazilian wax drunk. Now I'll explain. (laughs) There was an office Christmas party. It was at lunchtime. We all got smashed. And then there was a Christmas party that evening and I needed a wax. So as I walked home, walked into the waxing place, it doesn't hurt at all if you're drunk. And I thought, there is a business idea. I could start up a series of cocktail bars where you can get a wax. And I decided we'd call it the hair of the dog. Um... But you were saying your balance has changed. Everything's changed. Yeah, everything has changed. My instincts have changed. So my mum had MS when I was growing up, and uh, I, my whole life, if somebody near me has, like, fallen over, my instinctive reaction was always to go, like, down and under because, you know, her balance was not good, and so I would go and I'd get my shoulder under her, and then either we'd go over together or I'd get her up, right? Three months pregnant, I was walking with my dad, and he stumbled slightly, and my reaction was... Mm. No, you can go. <laughs> Fuck you. And it wasn't like a conscious decision. It was my body's like instinctive reaction was like, you can die. I've got the next generation. <laughs> yeah. No, I do, I do see that. It's so fascinating though. It's, Is there any my, other ways in which you've changed? I used to love roller coasters. Yes. Now I do not like roller coasters. Like my appetite for risk has changed. I used to love going on roller coasters. And now I spend the entire time, I've been on two roller coasters since giving birth. First, the whole time... Since giving birth? Yeah. Who gives birth and then goes, dream world? That's where I need to be. Who, how would you have gone on any roller coaster since giving birth? So there was a, that a, baby's very small. No, this is my, uh, my previous, my previous oh, baby. Oh, the previous baby. Yeah, since I was giving in London birth. and I had to because go and do... that one's quite small. I, just yeah. kind of, I know women who go, please give me some sushi. I wasn't able to have a was pregnant. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm just dying to have soft cheese. I've heard that, but no. never... Oh, get me on the twister. <laughs> Never once heard that. No, it was it was at the um, it was at a very posh music festival, which is as bad as you imagine. Yeah, just people. I hate it already. In, yeah, it was dust and people in suits going, "Oh my!" Like it was awful. <laughs> but then we were allowed to go on the rides for free because we were doing comedy at the end of the night after the fireworks, just when people love comedy. And uh, they said, "Go on the roller coaster," and I went on the roller coaster. I spent the entire time going, "This would be the stupidest way to die." Will it put bubbles in my milk? Wow. And you didn't enjoy it because you were just thinking about what That's if I die and then there's the baby. Yeah, the milk. I had a friend who her job was paras, parasailing, paragliding, um, and she was like a world champion. Parasocial. And, uh, you, you know, basically wings of tissue paper fly through the sky. Ooh. And people do die doing it, like at the professional level. And she, she, there are still world records she's broken, I think, for um, distance. And she'd go out into the desert, very, very... And she'd always be... Everything she did was something I had never even heard of. She'd always be like, oh, yeah, we're going rock raging this weekend or something like that. You know, you just think, what even is that? But it was all sorts of extreme sports. Um, and uh, ice climbing. Who would want to climb ice? Why? Why would anyone want to do that? But she just loved that. Just wait for it to melt. 
What climate change is for. (laughs) And then she uh, had a baby and she said, my desire to jump off things has just plummeted, ironically. Um, She was like, no, I just can't. I don't want to do that stuff anymore because if I die, what will happen to the children? And she said it didn't happen to her husband. He was like, oh, don't be so soft. You know, we'll be fine. We've always been fine before. And if we're not, they've got godparents. What are they for? What's the point of nominating godparents if you're not going to jump off something high? Um, and, uh, and I thought that was very, very interesting that, that your appetite for risk goes down. Yeah. Um, yeah, even for stand-up stuff. Even for stand-up comedy? Yeah, I'm more, I'm more stage fright than I was before. And then there's like, my, my eldest is two and a half, but yeah. Wow. But there's no real actual danger in stand-up. I mean, I was going to say you can't die, but we all know that's not true. But, like, you can't die in a meaningful way, in a literal way. No, but there's some evolutionary part in your back brain that goes, this is how women were burned as witches. (laughs) When they tried to be funny and the joke fell flat. Well, there's a coven up the back tonight. So (laughs) if anything goes wrong, join that coven. It's very strong. Excellent. There's there's all sorts going on up there. Fundraising, baby making. It's, uh, It's... it's incredible. And I feel like you, you've you always had a slightly witchy air about you. It's like, the hair. It's a, is it? Yeah. I feel like there's a supernatural air about you. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you should probably go and bless the coven. Oh, because yeah, I okay. think, especially with your recent fertility, there's fertility <laughs> up the back that needs blessing. So maybe you could go... <laughs> Could you take the baby up and do some kind of witch-like ceremony with the baby, bless them with the baby? I'll tell you what I I, I will give you is the gift of anyone in the audience who happens to have a boob and an intimate friend of any kind. Uh, Here's a thing that you can do. If they're sitting on the couch, you just come in behind them and put a boob on their head. And then you go, you got a boob on your head and no matter what they say, you can't take it seriously because they got a boob on their head. What? (laughs) <laughs> is that consensual? I like I said, an intimate friendship, sufficiently intimate friendship. Yeah, that they have to mind. be really quite intimate. Um, <laughs> if you're if you're if you're listening and thinking of this advice, I think you need to say to your friend, "How intimate would you say our friendship is on a scale of on a scale of one to boob on your head?" Before... Yeah, but you have to say that at least three months in advance of the boob oh, on yeah, the head, because yeah, otherwise yeah. they don't look as surprised. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of a terrible story that involves Kevin Spacey that I probably shouldn't tell. Um, oh, no. Yeah, no, really, t- genuinely. I, are you... <laughs> I don't... It's not really... I shouldn't have mentioned it because it's not really a story for a feminist event. But I do want to tell you, of course, because it's a great story. Um, there's a coven up on the left at the interval where I'll tell that story. Um, <laughs> Um, is there anyone you should ask? Is there anyone who came from somewhere not Brisbane? The Gold Coast. Just give us a cheer if you came from the Gold Coast. Excellent. Give us a cheer if I went to school with you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, give us a cheer if I'm related to you. Excellent. Great. Uh, give us a cheer if I used to be a Jehovah's Witness with you. Great. Super. Um, have I covered all my bases? Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, yes. What? What? You came from Canberra, but we have we are no relation. <laughs> oh, I see. Other places. That was other places. Yeah. You know we're going to Canberra tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah, but I'm here because my mum's from Brisbane. Oh, you're here because your mum's from Brisbane. So have you come specially for the show? Yeah, but I'm helping her move back to Canberra. Oh, you're helping her move back to Canberra. Gosh, that's quite a long story. Um, <laughs> have you come specially so you could see the show with your mum, or are you here accidentally? Uh, kind of both. <laughs> kind of both. Okay. Uh, anyone come especially for the show? Not to dampen what you've done, but I don't feel we're special in that story. Um, anyone come especially for the show? Yes? I went to Melbourne. You've come from Melbourne? We were there last night. No, I went to Melbourne. You went to the Melbourne show? Yes. Oh, my God, you travelled to go to the Melbourne show and now you're back here in Brisbane? Yes. I, we are so bad for the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anybody else? Where are you from? Where? Harvey Bay. Um, Noosa. Noosa. That's quite a long way. That's, are you still... Why are people laughing at that? Because it... Why is that funny? Harvey Bay's further. I'm a terrible Queenslander. I don't really know where bays are. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, well done, Harvey Bay. Well done, Noosa. Thank you so much for travelling. 
um, especially the person that went to Melbourne and back. Um, are you going anywhere else? You're coming with us to Canberra? It's like a Grateful Dead tour. <laughs> like, follow, like you're following Taylor Swift. That's like how we think, how we like to think of ourselves. Um, I mean, I mean, it is a podcast. It will come to you. That's true. Um, but you, you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, are you ready for some stand-up comedy? Yeah. Then please welcome to the stage the incredible Alice Fraser. Hello. Uh, hi, hello, welcome, thank you. Um, I did not announce my pregnancy until I was eight and a half months pregnant. Uh, because mainly because most of my job is podcasting and so it's like collarbone up work. Uh, but ma- it was it was because I didn't want the way that people treated me. I didn't want the way that people treated me to change. Right? I spent my whole life in this career telling everybody that my body doesn't matter, that my gender doesn't matter, that I'm as willing to do the shitty gig in the middle of nowhere as the next man who is definitely a man. Right? You know, I've done the gig where you drive eight hours and, and, and then you get free accommodation that turns out to be bunk beds with the other three acts, all of whom are men in their 50s, one of whom has a felony conviction. <laughs> one of whom so far. Um, <laughs> You know, I've done the gig on the boat with the bankers where they pay you in prawn cocktails and at the end of the trip they let you off on an island and the bankers hunt you for sport. I've done, I've done, the, I've done the gig where you drive for four hours and you get paid £150 and then someone else takes the car and you have to walk home. I've done, the gig where the, I've done the gig where the gig runs long and you miss the last train and you have to decide whether you're going to spend your money on a taxi home or an accommodation for the night or you take the chances with the free couch of a producer who calls himself Sleazy Dave. <laughs> I, didn't want, I, didn't want people, I didn't want the way people saw me to change and it does when you're pregnant, the way that people treat you changes. Like, for example, any teenage boy that I ever encountered from the moment that I became visibly pregnant had one of two options. Option number one, teenage boy encountering a pregnant Alice Fraser would immediately become a medieval knight. (laughs) Oh, madam, go before me onto the bus. Behold, Flora, the goddess of fecundity, round in her beauty. Go forth, madam, go forth. Walk across my coat. Option number one. Option number two for a teenage boy encountering a pregnant Alice Fraser was that they could not look at me. (laughs) Their eyes slid around me like I was bending light. I was a fucking stealth plane. It was extraordinary. (laughs) And I get it. I don't want to blame teenage boys. It's very hard to be a teenage boy at the best of times. And I was the physical embodiment of consequences. (laughs) I didn't want to announce that I was pregnant because I didn't want the platitudes. I loathe platitudes and motherhood is the mother load of platitudes. You say, I'm afraid of giving birth. And they say, all mothers are heroes. Which is what they say to you when they're about to not pay you enough. (laughs) Beware, anyone here who is in a job where they call you a hero, they are not going to pay you enough. And at some point, they'll try and sell you a t-shirt about it. (laughs) Heroes. You say, I'm afraid of giving birth, and they say, don't worry, the night you give birth is is the first date where you're guaranteed to meet the love of your life. (laughs) Maybe, it's also the first date where you're guaranteed to have at least three strangers see your vagina, and sometimes you're in the mood for one kind of date, and sometimes you're in the mood for the other kind of date. (laughs) Rarely both of those dates at once. And of course you have this fear, and I know this is like quite a contentious thing to say, but you worry that you have the baby and, you know, maybe it's a tech bro. (laughs) Oh no, what if I have a baby that's a tech bro? What if I have a baby that wants to disrupt a market sector with an AI (laughs) chatbot? I think, I think I've, got, I've got one boy and one girl, uh, not in that order, and, but, you know, obviously, uh, gen, no. Um, I think often about what I want to tell my daughter, right? I wanna, I wanna, what, the advice that I want to give her to go out in the world. I say, I want, I want, I want you to grow up and be a, a strong, gentle, kind woman. I don't want you to let your success be defined by the success of the patriarchy. I don't want you to, I want you to decide what it is for yourself. I want, what else do I want her to know? I want her to know that 90% of mist in graveyards is just goths vaping. 
Yeah, it looks spooky on screen, but in real life it smells like dank bubble gum. <laughs> I want to tell my daughter not to date Leonardo DiCaprio. Fuck! <laughs> I've just given birth to a baby girl who in 18 years' time will be entering a geriatric Leonardo DiCaprio's dating pool. <laughs> you know this, guys? He's never dated anyone over the age of, like, 25. He just trades them in for a younger model. It's, I, I, people are very mean about it on the internet, which is not going to work. He's too old to know how to read the internet. <laughs> Most recent girlfriend they got together when she was 19, allegedly. 19! 19! 19! Technically legal. Technically legal, technically legal, technically legal, technically legal, technically legal. Although if you do say technically legal too many times when you're talking about your sexual relationship, you turn into Woody Allen. <laughs> That's not fair. That's mean. They're just two nice men who are irresistibly attracted to old souls. <laughs> I was going to end on that. Uh... I'll end on this, which is that you... Nobody told me this before I became a mother. Felicia, you might want to know this on your journey. Uh, nobody... I thought you got to choose what kind of a mother you are. It turns out you just find out. <laughs> like, you just discover it on the go. Like, I found out that I'm not a millennial mother the moment I gave birth and didn't immediately mint my baby as an NFT. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a strict mum. I'm not a get him off the boob, give him a job kind of a mum. I'm a milk and love kind of mum. I'm not a hippie mother, although that would have been fun. It looks like fun, the hippie mothers. You know the hippie mothers? You know, there's a lot of uh, undyed cotton, a lot of ha holding hands in circles, a lot of connecting to the infinite chain of vaginas in the sky, a lot of charging up rocks in the moonlight. You don't cut the umbilical cord until the baby's old enough to use scissors. Uh, and I realised that I'm not that kind of mum when I, when I gave birth. And I realised that... Um, it doesn't need to be spiritual to be profound, right? Because you know what happens? A person arrives. You're not getting it. Um, a person that didn't exist arrives in the world through you. You're a fucking portal to the numinous. You are... <laughs> Quick, make it smell like sandalwood. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charles Fraser. <laughs> Welcome back, Alex Fraser, everybody. <laughs> oh, we have a very special guest for you now, Brisbane. She is a spoken word poet, educator, and community activist. She is a proud African woman who aims to represent black Muslim women in the poetry scene through sharing her experiences to allow other young women like herself to see just how much is possible. She was the Australian Poetry Slam champion 2021. She is a published author and the founder of Black Ink. Um, she is the founder of She Is, a local all-women BIPOC exhibition. Put your hands together because you're in for a treat. Make incredible welcoming, guilty feminist woohooing noises for Huda the Goddess! Uh, before I start, I'd like to take a second to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging and acknowledge the Sam and Yagara and Turbo country and how humbled and honored I am as a woman from far, far away to be able to drop an ounce into this ocean full of stories and history and culture and language and a community that refuses to be forgotten to any First Nations person in the room. Thank you. depressing part of the night where you might possibly cry, sorry, not sorry. Um, my name is Huda the Goddess, and I promise you it is not a name I gave to myself because I think I'm fabulous, which I am. Um, it is a title given to me and provided. I am an improvised poet, which means whatever you will see from me tonight is poetry I have made up on the spot. 
um, and it lives absolutely nowhere else. So if you don't catch it, sorry. That I will apologize for. Can I get a hand up if anyone has been to an open mic before, has heard live poetry? Just a hand up. Thanks, all six of y'all. Um, I appreciate you and your dedication to the art. Um, whenever I get on a set, I like to take time to be present in a room and decide what the room requires from me. Um, and as much as I like to be able to take pieces from the conversations and the spaces that were created, um, there's a story I feel the urgency to say today. Um, and that story is the representation of Sudanese women right now that are undergoing a war, the displaced women that are fighting and are at the forefront of our revolution. Um, Sudan is falling apart. Um, and women, like the women who raised me, continue to be the anchor of those communities. Um, so today, during my first poem, I would like for you to give me a snap, right? Which is usually poetry protocol 101. You probably never snap in your life consciously. You're like, what are we doing? Um, and this is a simple gesture to let me know that you are with me, to let me know that you are present. Not only is it very scary to be up here on stage um, and hear nothing, um, but it is also sending vibrations to those women overseas. Um, and trigger warning, um, I've had to help my own family flee to Egypt. And in that process, I've watched my auntie get shot in the foot who has diabetes and live in a mosque for three months with her adopted daughter that she could not get across the border because she had no papers and no man to accompany her. And that is the reality of women across oceans who do not have the vocal cords and the power to be able to be heard and differences be actually elevated and change be executed. So this poem is to the Sudanese women, to the black women, and to the women who have been robbed of their vocal cords because I was raised in a matriarchy. And that means I have seen power bleed through generations of women that enable me to be here today. So tonight I honor them in this piece. To the revolutions that used to exist in our kitchen on Fridays with my grandmother's bare hands as she turned the kitchen into magic, turned her voice into a lullaby as she taught me the women I know, a generations of history that bleed through her vocal cords, that she had a voice like a lullaby that would rest all of our worries and give them a bed to live on. I was raised in a home with the leaders being women and they have curved smiles and hands that have become exhausted with carrying broken people. I know what it is like when your country starts to scream and the Nile turns bloody and revolutions are started and held on women's bare chest and they become our soldiers. Turn their hands into paintbrushes, draw out a canvas in the world and tell them that we matter. I have seen women raise kings and queens out of possible statistics in the midst of their own bare hands, turn their voices into prayer, dig their heels into grounds and stomp hard enough that our ancestors awaken from split grounds. I have seen women use the sunlight to be able to radiate truth. I have seen revolutions carved out and tattooed on the tip of their tongues. The inside of their minds turned into libraries. I have seen generations of melanin and godliness. I have seen language host in their mid-outs. I know what it is like when black means magic when our revolutions are women with scarves that clean up grounds that have somebody's son's blood stains. And I know what it is like to watch a mother cry her eyes into blindness. Cause what mother would want to see a world without her loved one? I have seen women cure broken men, place their chest back together. I have seen women turn warriors with spears in their spinal cords, carry revolutions on their back ages that no one will give them center stage. I have become the voice of generations. I have been the victor of those who are not heard have untied my vocal cords. I have prayed to God in my poetry, bent my hands and created truth on pages, whispered and screamed to strangers so that my people could be seen. Cause as we fight to be visible, to be human, to be cared for, there is a woman out there that is using her broken clothes to create shelter. There is a child with brown eyes that is dimming from the world that is using barricaded, rooms as cover. I have seen 
Generations of women be buried by the world and the only thing we have to offer is a tear that doesn't turn into an action. Hands that have always cut for me but were never wanted to help. So when I ask, would you be part of the revolution? This is an awakening. I am thousands of years of bloodshed scars. I am spears and I'm a voice that lives through them. So this is more than just a poem. This is an attempt to save a nation, an attempt to make sure that my kids do not have to carry me on their shoulders because I have stopped being human. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, the second part of my poetry is I always offer a poem that I make up based on what you want to hear. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to give me a word, and I'm going to give you a poem, and then I'm going to get out of here. Power. So, I like that. Power. By the way, I have ADHD. Shouts out to Neurodivergence. And I was proudly diagnosed at the age of 28. Um, because, you know... All things that I do just make me crazy and they're never valid for me to actually have a diagnosis. But I am here and I'm proud of all the things that make me quirky and different. So in the process of me speaking, if there is a word that you want me to join in the poem, just throw it at me. It's not a disturbance. I'm listening, all right? Power is my first word. To the warrior they tried to silence. To the magician that has created hope out of empty spaces. To the woman with a crooked smile and glasses that have been able to see visionary things and smiles and women that needed her love at times when she was just a stranger to them. To the woman that encompasses what it means to redefine love, become the own author and illustrator of her own revolutions. To the one that has decided her silence makes anyone who does not know themselves see the reality of what a woman is without the prescription of the world to the one who has created her own throne but never needed a crown to be placed for her to understand that legacy is her own. To the one who has built herself a home, left no roof so she could fly, turn her arms into a shield, dance with the wind, allow her skin to be kissed by the sun, to the one that turned power into a visionary moment where she can dance in bare winds and stand on cloud tips. To the one that knows what a legacy is, what revolutions are built, where silence can greet a woman who has known truly what it means to be herself. Keep going. Y'all got shy. <laughs> we had power. We had rings. Don't stop. Keep going. I'm, I can hear everybody. I love it. I heard a lot of things. My first act of evolving out of a system that has tried to restrict me to birthing babies that they still choose not to love when they look like women to the ones that told me my legacy is bending my body to recreate world into this but I meant nothing without it. My first love story was choosing to love myself out of the description the world has given me. My legacy has been choosing who I am, rewriting my own book, becoming the author and the illustrator and making you be an audience to something you have been afraid when it gets their freedom. Thank you. That was your work. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. To the revolution of women, of greatness, of art. To the Sudanese women everywhere. Thank you so much. Who does that us, everybody? Who that was absolutely wonderful. And we're going to be hearing more from you on the sofa in the second half. So I will interview you then. For now, who the goddess? So it's nearly time for interval and various covens. If you're not currently in a coven, you could form one. There's probably people here you've known, you've done other projects with. Just point to someone you, you know but you didn't know was going to be here tonight. Yeah, yeah, there's a few people pointing. Or just introduce yourself to someone at the bar and ask them what they're doing. Uh, remember my rule, three is a coven, by which I mean a WhatsApp group. And who knows what else, in the I'll come back in a year or so, and you'll be like, well, we did this, we did this, we did this, because we met someone here tonight. Are you excited about that? <laughs> Have you enjoyed the show so far? <laughs> Excellent. Who's planning an interval coven? <laughs> Not that many people. Most people just want to drink. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. You're here for a night out. Um, all right. Uh, so, to close our first half, there is somebody who without whom I dare not travel anymore because people would shout, it's not the guilty feminist without her. Put your hands together 
and make incredible whirling noises all the way from the UK. It's the wonderful Grace Petrie. <laughs> follow that well I thought what I would do is improvise a song no fuck that no I'm gonna sing one I already know um uh yeah I love uh I love it when there's a baby backstage um I feel like we've really teased the baby <laughs> I don't think the baby's gonna come out on stage but um so now it feels like we're just rubbing your faces in it that there's a very cool baby backstage but this is uh, I, I, I thought I'd sing a song about a baby from my own life um, uh, she's not a baby anymore uh, but uh, ten years ago this summer um, my niece was born my niece is uh, got a clap in Brisbane um, wow she's uh, I didn't know she was so big over here but that's um, good to know uh, and, uh, and I was at a festival, I was at a music festival, I was at playing at Glastonbury in the UK. Anybody been to Glastonbury Festival? Yeah, cool. So um, I was there and uh, my uh, sister, who is one of my best friends in the whole world, was um, uh, nine months pregnant and she was about to go into labour. Um, and I got a phone call when I was at the festival telling me that um, the, the hour had arrived, right? And uh, so I got in the car and I drove five hours home from the festival to where I'm from uh, in the UK. And, uh, and uh, I wrote this song about that trip. My niece is called Ivy. And this song also is called Ivy. Um, and it goes like this. Um, uh, just a couple of little uh, British Australian um, translations for you. Um, the M5 is a motorway. Um, the, the main stage at Glastonbury, that's called the Pyramid Stage. That's where Ed Sheeran and Adele play and people like that. And, uh, and K uh, have you heard of Kasabian? Oh, fuck. Um, are you, do, do you like Kasabian? Oh, fuck. Well, Kasabian, Kasabian are a rock band. They're from my hometown of Leicester, and uh, we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> this song is good, Ivy, and it goes like It was Glastonbury 2014. And it was back to the camp and it was pack up the tent And it was saying goodbye to Billy Bragg as we went And telling our friends that we had somewhere to be Someone so much more important than all those VIPs It was your mum on the phone that rerouted us We got a hug goodbye from Phil Jupiter's And then we drove all night from Glastonbury to me to arrive, Ivy, and I drove until the sun came up to beat you home, all the way up the M5, Ivy, and being early for someone was a first for me, but I thought my heart would burst if you got there before me, and all the way home, all I thought was how I can't wait to tell you this story, Ivy. Thanks for waiting for me And I can't wait to know the person you'll become And I can't wait to hear what music that you like And I can't wait to know the future as you'll make it I drove all night from Glastonbury to meet you home When you were ready to arrive, Ivy How I drove until the sun came up to beat you home All the way up the M5, Ivy And being early for someone was a first for me But I thought my heart would burst If you got there before me and all the way Home all I thought was how I got to tell you this story, Ivy. 
So that was the first half. Join us for part two, which should be in your feed right now.